You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Year Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. The Oxford Executive MBA enables current and future business leaders to make a difference in their chosen field. The part-time program is designed to fit alongside your work commitments and offers you a global network. Visit the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford website for further details. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Suda, and I'm with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. One thing I've learned today is that progressives really like to have compact, fast panels. I've got about 45 minutes with this expert panel. Um, most of you have been here throughout the day, and you've talked about the challenges that democratic societies are facing on both sides of the Atlantic, and we had a great sum up from our experts just now. So I'm gonna get right to it. I'm gonna ask a few questions to each of the panelists and then open it up to Q&A. Um, and I'm gonna start with Robert Habeck. Um, Mr. Harbeck, I mean, you represent the Green Party, and I'd like to know, when you talk to voters, how do you talk about sustainability and economic growth? I mean, most voters, I think, think they're mutually exclusive. How do you let them know that this, it's possible to be sustainable and also achieve economic growth? Hi, everyone. Well, if, when I talk to um, in Green Party environment about sustainability, I always get applause. That is not the, not the problem. The problem is that the ones who are afraid of the change, another change, an ecological change in infrastructure, that they don't listen. And um, coming back to the question of this panel, the, the question is why is that so? I agree completely with what has John has said with the three measures, how we can adopt the change, but we need a majority. We need a political force to do so. And how do we get that? And um, maybe there we have to come back to the thoughts of the problem or the urge of the problem. I think at the heart, at least in Europe, lies the finances crisis of the euro still. And it was the austerity policy that destroyed the faith in the political class, if you want to say so. So there was a feeling of um, the welfare state cannot protect me and I lose my job, I lose my wages, I lose my social security and so on. And now another change is coming, ecological change, um, digitalization and so on. And if we don't give back the trust in the political, uh, political ability to protect people also from change, to give them security, we always talk in the progressive milieu. There we have um, applause in the Green Party. Everyone is for the ecological change and the big transformation. But this would not be enough, but still is dividing the society. So this is what um, Michael said in the beginning, that, um, that progress in itself is a paradox. We have a lot of progress. We can go further. We can change. We, we know what to do. But you, the, the, the more we know, the more progress we want, the bigger grows the, the withstand against it. And to change that, to, to break this, uh, this withstand, we have to talk about social justice and, um, and good organized welfare state, I think. And actually, that sort of leads to my next question, because you know the Green Party is surging here in Germany, and perhaps you have a chance to be a kingmaker in the next federal government, but you address it yourself. I mean, you do just speak to certain segments of the society. Do you think you could expand your tent? Is there a possibility to do that so that you can make more voters embrace change with a progressive blueprint for the future? Well, the one point is that social security is an issue and um, even the, the people in the, the middle class people are afraid of losing their, uh, their the wealth they have now. They are not poor, but they are afraid of becoming in, uh, getting in disruption. But um, on the other hand, it's, I think it's not, only the economy, it's not only the economy stupid. It's about um, dignity and recognition that um, you have to tell a story to, to explain what is happening in the world and do it 
not only for your small group of um, of, um, of of people, but telling a story of that also the ones who had to, who are losing their jobs in the automobile industry, for example, or the coal mines, for example, they are needed. They are part of the society. And this is what we have learned, or what we are trying to learn, we the Greens, that we are not pointing finger and saying, well, we know what is right, and it's your fault that you haven't, you haven't committed to the change the last 10 years. See what's happening now, you're getting unemployed. That we should not do anymore, and hopefully we haven't done it so strong, but still, we have to build up a new we identity. And this should include the ones who are against the change. So there should not be a point of talking about them, but talking with them. And, I mean, maybe you can address that change. I mean, this, like you said, the title is about transformation. What are the trigger points in Germany right now when you think about change and what people are apprehensive about here? Well, I give you another example. But this had nothing to do with uh, ecological change. I was um, minister in minister in Schleswig-Holstein. This is the northernmost part of Germany. Also for the fishermen, yeah, fishermen. I think you don't know much about fishery, but they have to adapt to the ecological change as well. And they hate green ministers. They, they. They, we, I'm not their friend. And. But when I said to them, you are part of the tradition of the country, you build the identity of this country, and I want you to be part in the future of this identity as well. Of course, you have to change, but let me talk about with you about um, how many money you need, what kind of ships you need. Then they then they were beginning to listening to me. And this was, I think this is the same we have to do with these well, the people in Eastern Germany who are afraid of losing their job because of um, we are getting rid of the um, liquid coal and um, to give them a part even in the future and to give it respectfully. Uh, let's, well, this is hard for my party as well as this German we was never part of our history. We were the left-wing small group of uh, the ones who knew it better all the time. But now I'm talking about something that's called left-wing patriotism or something like that. We need, a, we need a um, common ground, including the ones who are not now opposing this, um, this change and progressive change. Okay, I'm going to stick with Germany and then move my way west with this panel. So I'm going to turn to Reiner Hoffmann, who's chairman of the DGB here. You know, what do you think about left-wing politics? Do you think it's your, it's people, the duty for people in the center left to address the people that feel abandoned? I mean, that have flee to perhaps um, the fringes to right-wing populism or even left-wing populism? Do you think it's a duty for um, politicians like Robert Habeck to bring them back into the fold? Yes, certainly. It's a, it's a huge necessity to bring uh, people back. And if we talk about, about transition, what are the fears of uh, uh, workers? What are the fears of citizens? Uh, and we learned uh, the lessons in Germany over the last two, three years that uh, we can't be uh, satisfied and certainly not be happy that right-wing parties are on the increase. And this has to do, amongst other things, with uncertainty. And people, see, and people feel uncertain, as Robert Habeck said, in the process of change, that they will not uh, uh, fall uh, behind, uh, that we take them with us. And I think we have learned a, a lot of lessons, uh, especially the trade unions uh, and the workers are well aware uh, that we have to fight uh, for decent jobs. Def decent jobs also in this quite complex process of transition. And uh, transition is driven by globalization, digitalization, ecolo uh, ecological change, climate change. So, and uh, as, as Robert said, people getting uncertain. What will happen with me in the future? They are quite wealthy for the time being, but will I have a decent job in the next five, ten years? Will my kids have a decent job? And uh, what we have learned, for example, that uh, approximately 200, 300,000 new jobs have been created in the renewable uh, industry sector. But in comparison to the classical industry sector, they are less well paid, longer working time, not so good working conditions. And uh, here this was the reason why we are started also 
to rebuild our relations with political parties, also with the Greens. That is a couple of uh, weeks ago that we met together with the uh, top leaders of the Green Party, with the DGB board, and we reflected what will happen in this process of transition. And one element to give people more security is that they have decent jobs, and decent job means that they are well paid, that they have decent working conditions. And one of the preconditions for having decent jobs is that they are sheltered by collective agreements. But what we are exper experiencing uh, over the last decades, that collective, uh, the, the coverage of collective bargaining is on the decline. So what can we do, especially in this process of change, if we going towards new sectors, new industries, that they are also covered by decent jobs? And on this, at the same time, that's the lesson we, we learned, that sustainability has always to build upon three strong pillars. The ecological pillar, for sure, but it has also to be economically um, sustainable and, last not least, it has to be social sustainable. And how we bring these three pillars together? Sometimes we have a clear clash of interests, we have to discover the reasons and build upon new trust, and new trust can be built upon new relationships uh, and creating progressive uh, majorities for uh, decent jobs, a better world, and uh, at the same time to uh, fighting successfully climate change, because also workers know there is no work on a dead planet, so we have to do something immediately. And a last sentence, uh, probably, if it comes to the uh, climate uh, agreement uh, from Paris. It has been the international trade union movement who has fought it that in the preamble we have a strong reference to just transition. What does it mean, just transition? That people will, in this process of change, by the end have not bad jobs, that they have decent jobs. This is our common goal and our common target. Okay, I mean, that's a very modern picture of unions here in Germany, and I mean, if we go to Great Britain, people often say here, well, Germany has a healthy manufacturing base compared to Great Britain, and the the decrease in collective bargaining in Great Britain. Um, Ali Stads, you're a member of the uh, Labour Party, shadow treasury secretary for the party. What can you talk about structural change and how that perhaps has led to Brexit? I mean, I think that we've seen a number of negative developments, I would argue, in the UK economy, particularly over the last 10 years. So it took us much longer to recover from the financial crisis than many other countries. So we've had eight years of stagnating wage growth that's only just ticked up over the last year, actually. So that recovery in living conditions that happens in many other countries is only just really happening now in the UK. But we've also seen a real regional polarization occur as well um, between the north and south of the UK and it has been correlated interestingly with the extent to which different regions have been affected by um, trade competition so actually the strongest predictor of those areas which voted strongly for Brexit wasn't uh, education level although that was a very very strong predictor, um, it was actually whether somebody was living in an area where many jobs had gone due to uh, the impact of trade. I suppose you could call it globalisation, but of course that term is so contested we hardly know what it, what it means anymore. Um, uh, in terms of how that led to the, the Brexit result more generally, Obviously, there was a grievance there because when people see that their living conditions aren't improving and they anticipate their children's will be worse than their own were, um, they want to have politicians listen to them. And when I was talking to people on the doorstep, the message that came across very clearly in the referendum campaign was that people were really fed up with the status quo. They were fed up with politicians. Often, though, they would say, not you, love, uh, but we don't like them generally. So there is that big, big, big gap there. Um, uh, and I think, to be honest, there's a lot that certainly the left in the UK still has to learn from that process. But probably, I would say, progressives right across all of Europe. Because, um, I mean, I knew that we were going to lose that referendum because of the discussions that I'd had. But it came as a shock to many other progressive people that I knew. So we need to make sure we don't have that complacency. And we're talking about change. Um, in fact, you know, it's actually 
one thinks about Germany, how the center is still sort of holding here, and it's been an oasis of stability, but actually this country has gone through tremendous change. We just, it seemed, it's, it's, it's been 30 years since reunification, so they've been through that, but now it seems like in Great Britain and in the United States, there's lots of structural change and people are somewhat facing the abyss. You're dealing with this on a daily basis when it comes to the Brexit debate with your constituents. How do you explain complex issues to them, especially in the face of massive disinformation? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, a very important question. And I think quite often politicians in the UK have been standing related to where they're sitting, right? And I represent Oxford East, which has got a lot of highly educated people in it. So um, I try as much as possible to go around the country and talk to people from other backgrounds about some of these questions. I think. You know, we've learned that actually, we've learned the hard way that many of the concepts that we use to talk about what we want to achieve as progressives just don't have any resonance with people um, on the doorstep or in their workplaces. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think the social chapter is a wonderful thing. I think working rights are really wonderful things. Do people I talk to on the doorstep know exactly what I mean when I use those terms? In the UK, a lot of the time they don't. People did attach meanings that they really cared about to the Leave campaign slogan, which is take back control. And of course, that could mean so many things. I think, you know, as a socialist, I believe in taking back control, collective control over processes that are increasing inequality and causing discrimination. Um, but sadly, the right, which was the main uh, 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 leader of the Leave campaign, they had a very, very different view of taking back control. But because it was a phrase that encompassed everything, that's why they used it. So we have to learn from that and I think have that discipline of being clear about the language that we use and always banging on the same drum. Um, otherwise, people are, are just not going to hear that message. Okay, moving westward to Michael Veritz, <laughs> located in Washington with the Center for American Progress. You've been an observer of uh, center-left politics in the United States. Have they abandoned the middle class, the the center left, and uh, you know, or, or or would you say that actually right now people in Europe should be looking at the United States as the vanguard for politics, progressive politics? Well, a ask me in a year and a half, and I tell you whether you should have looked to the United States. Um, <laughs> but I would say, uh, to a degree, not the center left has abandoned the middle class, but uh, parts of the middle class have abandoned uh, the democratic. Um, uh, consensus, uh, because we still struggle with the notion that Donald Trump virtually came out of nowhere. And I think as progressives, we need a short-term strategy, and most of that has been spelled out here on the panel and during the day. But we also need to do some deep thinking on how this came about, specifically in the United States with its democratic and libertarian traditions, but also in Europe. And if you look at the, uh, the, the people that supported the president, especially the white voters, his supporters are overwhelmingly white, they are socioeconomically, it's an interesting setup. About one third of Donald Trump voters make less than $54,000 a year, which is the median income in the United States. So they are working class. Another third, roughly speaking, make anywhere between $54,000 and $100,000, depending on where you live, you're in the middle classes, and another third makes over $100,000. So we have been in our analysis for a long time, and rightly so, this is where the next election is gonna be won, focused on the lower third of the, of the voter migration from Barack Obama towards Donald Trump of uh, lower income whites, especially in the Midwestern states. But numerically, these are maybe 12, 13, 14 million people. President Trump got 62.9 million votes, and I'm very concerned about the other 45 million, because they are Americans that are solidly middle class. And if you look at the distinguishing factor, the single most defining factor of these people voting for Donald Trump is authoritarianism. And that's fascinating that you have educated middle-class Americans living in the suburbs, sending their children to public schools that are in good shape, having two cars and doing two vacations a year, thinking of themselves as decent American law-abiding citizens, voting for this president and continuing to support him. And if you look at what, these, what motivated these people, the fascinating thing is that Donald Trump created this Bermuda Triangle of fear between globalization, embodied in trade, terrorism, 
embodied in Islam and Muslims, and migratory movements embodied in Mexico and Mexicans. The problem for us is when the president talks about Mexico and Mexicans, he talks about a lot of people, but neither about Mexico nor about Mexicans. But this strategy of fear-mongering has triggered authoritarian impulses in people that themselves did not know that they had them. And this has been hardened because of the constant onslaught of racist arguments, fear-mongering, and that's very, very difficult to reverse. And so I think for us, one of the tasks is to implement all the social policies and be convincing to working class voters that we lost. At the same time, we have to think about these middle classes that willy-nilly give away democratic standards, subscribe to a president who now among Republican uh, party members has a 90% approval rating and still think that they uh, find themselves within the bounds of the American Constitution and democratic traditions. And you mentioned migration, immigration as being a hot button issue in the United States. It always has been, but obviously there's lots of fear wrapped around this topic. How do you win voters back? How do you provide context? Look, this is very, very difficult, and there are people uh, like Will Marshall here that know uh, about this a, a lot better than I do. So right now you have uh, a lot of progressives uh, making sure that we cannot be accused of open border progressives, that basically open up the borders and then you have people from all over the world coming to the United States. At the same time, we have a million immigrants a year. They're contributing economically to the United States. Um, if you look at the Latino population, the Latino population in 2050 will be 31 years of age on average. That's a demographic bonus because they resupply our workforce because they're going to pay for my pension. While here in Germany, you'll be in a different situation because in 2050, average German age is going to be close to 51 years. It means half the population is older than 51. Explain to me how you maintain a social system in healthcare with doing that. So I think um, the arguments are on our side, but the problem is because Republicans talk about migration and don't talk about migration, but they talk about fear and anxieties, this is extremely difficult to frame. And I think we have to walk a thin line, but at the same time sticking to our principles and saying the United States is not only a country of immigrants, we also have a majority among people that are younger than 18 years in the United States that are non-white. We are going to be the first non-majority society by the end of the 2030s. The United States, it, what has always was, a big sociological field experiment, and I think people need emotional reassurance. There is as much material as immaterial reassurance that people need that we as a society can live together. And I think we're sometimes underestimating that. Obviously, for me here sitting on this chair, this is a lot easier said than done in Iowa, Ohio, New Hampshire, or Florida if you confront voters that are fearful. Okay, I'm gonna go back to Germany before I turn to the audience for questions because Michael mentioned, I mean, the good times are happening right now in Germany. I mean, if you think about it, life is quite good, quite prosperous, and Angela Merkel didn't really need to be emotional over the past few years. I mean, when you talk to voters and when you talk, think about labor unions, Reiner, what are you thinking about? What keeps you up at night about what's made upon Germany in the next couple of years? Yes, yeah, certainly uh, we have a quite robust labor market uh, since a couple of years, the highest employment rate ever since re uh, reunification. But uh, we have also to acknowledge that we have in Germany the highest low-wage sector in Europe, that more than 7 million uh, workers uh, earning less uh, than 12 euros an hour. Uh, so we have a segmented labor market. This is one of uh, the challenges uh, we are facing. Second one is that uh, we have been quite uh, attentive uh, as we learned that trade union members are voting uh, slightly over the average in favor for the AFD. This was for us, to some extent, quite shocking. Um, we went uh, through it uh, into uh, more depths. And what I said earlier, uh, people, even if they have decent jobs, um, uh, if they have a decent income, they feel more and more uncertain. They individually believing that they lost control, uh, lost control on what's going on with digitalization. 
uh, they lost control what's going on with globalization. And uh, they fear that the future for the children could be much more insecure than their own life. And uh, at the same time, then we conducted a study which discovered that in companies where workers are sheltered by strong workers' representation, by collective agreement, the support for the AFD is below the average. That means quite clearly that people need some sort of safety net. Uh, they are aware that we are undergoing an in-depth process of transition and we can't stop it. But the question is, what are our visions to shape this process, to give people really a perspective that climate change is not, uh, uh, is, is not a risk for their job, that it can be opportunities, that digitalization is not only a risk, that we can shape those processes. And that means that we have to be much more attentive also to listen to our members, to listen to workers at the plant level, in regional levels. Because there is a high degree on mistrust against uh, political parties, uh, but also to some extent against trade unions. Because we are part of the uh, system and uh, how we can get back trust, trust of people that we have a vision that, we, that they can participate in it and that uh, in the undergoing process of change that they have uh, a social net where they will not lose jobs, they, they will not lose their, their wealth uh, and uh, their children will have a, have a future. So we have to be much more attentive uh, and we have to much, much more, uh, I would say, uh, much more frank also in uh, discussing uh, alternatives and uh, giving people really a perspective, really visions. Robert, I'm going to give you the last word on this. Uh, you know, you, the Green Party is known as the Environmental Party, but many of the major parties have co-opted this platform. Is it enough to be just the party for the environment? What, what's your message today to voters? Well, obviously not, because if you're only focusing on one issue, you would can't adopt to this change in society. And Michael just said it's material and immaterial issues, and I think that's that's right, and Rainer mentioned the um, the um, the way wages went down in some parts of the society. I think the lesser the lesser third lost netto wages in the last um, 15 years. So if you compare it to the price rising, you've got lesser than you have today. Uh, you have today than you had um, 15 years ago. Of course, the the welfare level is rising, but you've got compared to others, you have lesser. So we have this unfair unfairness in society, and we have to get rid of that. Of I think this is uh, clear, and this is the easier part for politicians because there you can fix the things in a material way. You can raise taxes, and you. Um, have higher minimum wages and what and so on. This is used terrain. We we know what we can do. We have to do it, of course, but it's not so hard to find answers. Maybe there we can take back control and uh, argue for more fairness in the system. The, the the other part is much more harder. The immaterial part. I've been to a small town in Saxonia. It's called Glashütte. It's near to the Czech border. It's a very old traditional watchmaker. Is it the right word? Watches were made and high high end quality watches. So the people there have very good wages. The same as in Munich, where the other watchmaking town is, so that they are not going to Munich. They have to be paid very very well. Unemployment zero zero unemployment. Very good wages. AFD forty five percent. So it, uh, it, said nothing, it has nothing to do with um, being poor, being um, not part of the material fairness system. It must have some immaterial ground. And when you talk to the people, and, and the city is beautiful. If we have cities in, um, in West Germany, in the formerly Ruhrpott, where Duisburg or Essen or Oberhausen, the grass is growing between the pavements and so on, in Glashütte, it's you can eat from the street. It's so beautiful there. If we, if we, so, and and still they are unsatisfied, and they 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 really don't believe that the same as Michael has said that politics can change 
or um, what's, what's out, what is happening, they don't believe in the system, they're anti-democratic, and you can't really grab it. And this immaterial point of politics, I think, is not really addressed in politics because it's so hard to address. And it has much more to do with um, self-respect, recognition, and um, what we have learned, I think what we, what we are trying to learn is that when you are arguing from a defensive perspective, that when you always say it's not right to vote the AFD, it's not right to follow the right-wing populism, then you are always in the defensive. So somehow you must get rid of that to tell an immaterial story of um, going forward and being part of it and changing things to the better of your generation and the next generation. And because this is an immaterial, um, um, immaterial point, you, we're talking about storytelling, framing, speech, and um, yeah, well, um, being trusted. And this is, of course, um, hard. You can't find it in the economical um, books. How can you trust, how you can gain trust? This is a, a field experiment. And I think the Democrats in the US, they are trying to, to, um, to, to learn this field experiment. Okay, I have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, please raise your hand, uh, quickly identify yourself. It would be great if you can formulate a question, and I'll take two at a time. Um, you, sir, right here. Hi there, um, Richard Walker from uh, Deutsche Welle. Um, yeah, I would just like to pick up on what Robert Harbeck was uh, saying there, because I think the these, these sort of the immaterial uh, the sort of big idea is something that I was wondering if I would hear it today um, during today's sessions, a sort of a big emotional idea on the level of Annalise Dodds just said earlier, you know, take back control or make America great again. These are such sort of simple emotional messages about either collective or personal empowerment um, that I haven't heard it. Is there a progressive simple emotional message okay. that has that kind of level. Hold that thought, gentlemen over there. Thank you. Uh, Harley Schlanger from the US. One of the reasons people lost faith in politicians and politics is after the 2008 crash, banks were bailed out, speculators were protected, and people lost houses, people lost jobs, and still haven't made it back. Uh, I'm sad that Tim Ryan isn't here because he's a supporter of a very important policy, restoring Glass-Steagall in the United States, banking separation. With the problems here with Deutsche Bank and the speculation still limiting what the EU can do and the ECB continues to defend the bankers, shouldn't the progressive movement come out for something like banking separation and uh, a Glass-Steagall type system so that credit could go to the small and medium enterprises and the job creation? Hi, thank you. I'm Stephanie from uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so my question is basically when we talk about it, and I think the speaker earlier addressed this, talking about regressive taxes. So when we talk about basically raising the price of flights, raising the prices of meat, which has to happen, um, raising the price of wine that is imported from Chile or Australia. So how do we not punish um, the least um, uh, fortunate among us, um, the working class, because it's gonna feel, we're gonna lose votes, um, it's gonna feel like we're punishing them, so how do we bring them along, um, but still doing something, passing laws um, against um, anything that relates to climate change? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Terrific. So maybe we could bundle the economic questions. I don't know who'd like to take that, but um, the emotional ideas. Annalise, you talked a little bit about you know winning it back, and I heard earlier today about how the Republicans are so good at sort of staking their ground and being emotional, maybe negative right now, but um, how do you turn the table so that progressive politics offer depth, but also appeal and emotion? 
Yeah, I mean, this is an issue that I've been thinking about quite a lot this week, actually, because as many other countries have experienced, we've had also a lot of mobilisation around environmental issues in the UK. And the emotion of fear that people have been able to convey, I think, very successfully has been resonant and that has been pushing in a progressive direction, obviously, because I think it is sensitising even conservative politicians in the UK to start taking this issue much more seriously. Um, and I think that, that that issue about people's concern about the future for socialists and social democrats, I think it's got to shift into offering people security. Now, in the UK, that, that word has lots of connotations around things other than just what your economic position is. It also has connotations around people's safety and in policing terms, etc. as well. But really, we need to get into that ground too. Um, because actually, in many of our communities, people are very disturbed at the rise of organised crime and uh, uh, drug use, etc. So I think that value of security is one that we need to talk about. And we do need to talk about community as well, much, much more, and what makes community. And to be honest, in the UK community, in many cases, has been impacted on incredibly negatively by austerity, right? The two sides of the same coin, when you don't have public spaces that people can use, when you don't have community centres, when you don't have children's centres, people don't mix and they don't realise that the community is for all of them. So I think those two values about security and community are ones that we need to start talking about much more and start thinking through. Michael, do you want to add a little bit to the um, emotional ideas? Uh, right. Uh, I think this goes back to the issue of, uh, of immaterial uh, uh, questions. Uh, let me let give you one example. I, I spoke to a Trump voter in, uh, who came from Detroit a while ago, who used to work in the car industry, got laid off, and was now working for one of these big Amazon distribution centers. And he said, well, good job, a lot more money, safer, my hands are not dirty, I'm running all these fancy robots and moving, moving boxes all day. And I said, why the hell did you vote for Donald Trump? And he looks at me and says, hey man, I used to build cars, now I'm moving boxes. And I must say, I, I didn't have an answer. This, this is difficult and this is also why I think, um, of course, conservatives are, are better, at least in, in the United States, uh, it's a little different here, in fear-mongering, right? Uh, to basically say, make America great is not a problem. If you say, make America great again, the devil is in the, in the again, because it basically means turning the wheel of history back to 1957 towards race segregation and insinuating some people of some color are better than others. And so I think the, um, uh, the last time there was a unifying message was under Obama, which was not a really defined message of change, but this worked because of who he was where he came from and the fact that we were desperately uh, trying to send George W. Bush into retirement. But it, as, a, as a slogan and as an idea, I thought the stronger together of Hillary Clinton, as bad as it sounded, was the right idea. You have to reassure people that there is a common future even with less prosperity, with less wealth and with less consumption of natural resources because every idiot knows that we can't go on another 30 years like this. But that's... So, I, again, this is very, very difficult, and I'm glad that I'm not the politician who has to talk to people in Glashütte because I know how difficult this is. But if we don't address this monumental change, and if we don't win this without resorting to fear mongering on the left or to forms of populism that structurally are equally damaging to the fabric of our society, we're not going to be able to swing this. Okay, maybe you gentlemen can take care of the economic questions. Why does it seem that the, you know, the upper echelons of society don't get whacked by taxes or high prices when the government changes policy. And is there a reckoning still with the banking industry that needs to be done after the 2008 financial crisis? Why it was so, it's hard to answer, but it's clear it was a political decision. And we, um, I think what the guy from the Deutsche Welle asked, um, how can you, can you, well, sorry, what was your name? Sorry, I didn't, meant, didn't got it. Um, the, uh, part of the answer is that you have to prove that you are able to fight with the big lobbies. If you want to gain trust in the ones who don't trust the political system anymore, you have to show some balls, sorry to say. Yeah. So if you if you if you are if you're talking about fairness, sometimes you have to prove that Amazon is paying taxes. And it's not Amazon paying taxes, you can't go to people in normal jobs and say, I want to raise the taxes for you. And if you can't bring, but let's say, um, 
wie, Double, wie ähm, VW to Volkswagen to building electricity cars, how can you talk to people that they should use uh, Deutsche Bundesbahn or electricity cars? So you have to, you have to show somehow braveness to fight against the ones in the big structures. This is not only necessary for, because they have the biggest lobbies, but it's necessary to, 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 to show that you really care for the things you are saying. And then maybe the people are listening that you are really trying to help them or you want to build up this new we, this uh, left-wing progressive um, patriotism somehow. But if you are just talking, then it's just words. Reiner, what do you think? Uh, I, I would uh, stress a point that we should reflect that we should become probably must, uh, much more outspoken, much more radical, especially with economic policies over the last two, three decades. We are all pretty much aware that austerity, neoliberalism has led us into this uh, situation where we are. Uh, so this is not an answer. What are our answers to talk about good societies, to give a positive vision? And I think we are much too shy to address points which are really critical. If it comes, for example, to a more fair taxation system. We don't like to take money away from the workers to pay more taxes. No, but we have to talk about redistribution because globalization is creating wealth. In significant, in significant uh, uh, numbers. But this wealth is more and more unequal um, distributed. So this is a point which people really can understand. And they fear that something is going wrong in societies. And the progressive forces, I think, have to be more outspoken, to talk about decent life, to talk about affordable housing, to talk about the city, the municipality we like to live in with functioning uh, public, uh, service, uh, public services, with public transport sectors and so on and so forth, because we have a lot of responses, a lot of answers, but I think we are much too shy, not outspoken, sometimes not radical enough. Okay, I hope that answered it for the Deutsche Welle guy, but I'd like to thank the panel. Um, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to more questions, but I was told we need to end on time because you need that 15 minute break to grab something to drink in this hot room. Let's give the panel a, a, a round of applause. And uh, be back here for, by seven o'clock, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time.